Welcome to my ESATS SAT Essentials video series. This is a 10-hour video personally paced SAT program that's designed to provide quality SAT preparation to all students. The series is split evenly between the three sections of the SAT, math, writing, and critical reading. The lectures cover effective SAT test taking strategies, review frequently tested topics, and provide practice problems that familiarize and prepare students for the real exam. The SAT Essentials video course is the foundation for all MyESAT courses and is used in conjunction with live MyESAT workshops. At MyESAT, our mission is to pave the way for brighter futures empowered by education for all students. Welcome to the second critical reading lecture. You remember me, I'm Adam, your critical reading instructor. I am psyched to see you guys back here for another fun-filled adventure of navigating through the, what is probably the hardest and longest test you've yet to take in your life. Today we're going to cover reading passages. Critical reading section is a jungle, then the reading passages are the lions. They are heavy hitters of the critical reading section. Worth the most points and also the most headaches. Reading passages, reading passages, oh man. What to tell you? This is probably the single most hated part of the SAT. By now, you should have taken at least a couple of practice tests so you know firsthand how tricky reading passages can be. The people who wrote the SAT definitely like throwing in some hard passages at you and also some uber tricky questions too while they're at it. Maybe you're the type of person who breezes through reading comprehension like you're a superstar. And if that is you, much props. You, yeah, much props. You should stand, flash your computer, a quick smile, maybe stand up, brush your shoulders off, because you are one of the lucky few. But let's say you're the type of person who hates reading passages section. Say you hate it with a passion. Say you hate it so much that you currently cannot wait to spend next Saturday morning at the dentist's office because somehow the fear that he might find a cavity is still less painful than the prospect of practicing reading passages. Well, if that sounds more like you, then you're definitely not alone. In fact, you're exactly like a majority of the kids who are studying for the SATs. I personally believe that the reading passages are the hardest part of the test to take, and it's definitely also the hardest section to teach, and that's a true story. But chin up, because hey, at the end of the day, the SAT is just a standardized test, and with every test, especially standardized ones, there are bound to be specific test-taking strategies that will help you navigate its waters. In fact, that's the reason why I'm here now, and why SAT courses exist at all. It's because knowledge of the exam and a healthy amount of practice really does your score good. In fact, with practice, anyone, reading superstar or not, can improve their score, and that is also a true story. Remember Maggie, my ESAT, your critical reading TA? Well, she just got back from a long vacation in Hawaii, snorkeling and sunbathing, so she's looking pretty tan and relaxed. I'm jealous. Hey there, Maggie. Thanks for coming back to help us get through this awesome SAT material. So one of the coolest benefits of a video course is that you can always hit pause or rewind anytime you need. So if it ever gets too much for you, or you need a second to jot a note down, or go to the bathroom, just hit that sweet little pause button. Me and Maggie, we got your back, and we'll always go at your speed. Ready? Let's go. Today, we are going to get you introduced to the reading passage section of the critical reading section. Reading passage is about 70% of your critical reading score, so yes, it's uber important. We'll talk about what kind of passages you should expect on the SAT. And then we're going to specifically talk about passages, including short passage strategy. Please, contain your extreme enthusiasm. The reading passage section of the SAT tests your ability to understand the stated and the implied meaning of very sophisticated reading passages. That means you will be asked questions like, what is the passage saying? And also like, 
what can be applied by the passage. There are three critical reading sections on the SAT. Each critical reading section of the SAT will include one or two long reading passages of different length, followed by six to 13 questions of assorted types. Two of the three critical reading sections will also include a pair of short passages, each about a length of a paragraph of 100 words. They will be followed by only four questions. Let's take a look at the reading passage directions. Remember that the directions will be the same on every SAT, so get familiar with them now so you don't waste your time on the real test. Let's read the directions together. The passages below are followed by questions based on their content. Questions following a pair of related passages may also be based on the relationship between the paired passages. Answer the questions on the basis of what is stated or implied in the passage and in any introductory material that may be provided. What are the most important words in these directions? They are underlined for you. It's stated and implied in the passage. This means you should only think about what is actually said in the passage. You might know quite a bit about the topic at hand already, but don't let your prior knowledge confuse you. Remember, all the answers you need are directly in front of you in the passage. Test makers know that you probably have some pre-existing knowledge of the subject. They also know that you may easily confuse one part of the passage with another part of the passage. Never answer the questions based on what you think you know. Always answer the questions based on what is stated or implied in the passage. Believe it or not, it's actually a handicap to know too much about the subject of the passage. Say you're a video game expert. Say you live and breathe StarCraft and you play World of Warcraft until you pass out from exhaustion at 3 a.m. every night. Well, what if you were to get a passage about the benefits of playing video games? You would go into that passage with all these personal preconceived notions, wouldn't you? You really have to try and put up a wall between what you know and what the author is actually saying. On the SAT test, the only thing in the world that matters is what passage actually means. Remember, the only answer to the questions based on what is said in the passage. For example, take a look at the following question. Which of the following does the author suggest is true about video games? A. Video games are a lot of fun. B. Generally, boys like playing video games more than girls do. C. Video games are a good way to learn hand-eye coordination. D. Video games often take years of practice to reach expert status. And E. Video games are very popular pastime. Since you are such an awesome video game player, you may think that all of these statements are true. You might jump at answer choice A and exclaim, yes, video games are fun. That's most definitely the correct answer. But stop yourself. The only thing that matters here is what the passage said. This leads us to the number one most important rule of all time. Make sure you can put your finger on the answer before you circle it. That's right. It means you should never consider a question correct until you know where in the passage the author answers the question. You should be able to put your finger on the answer in the passage before you pick your answer. Now let's talk about passages. What kind of passages will you see? The answer is almost every frickin' type under the sun. 
You will see articles about stuff you might enjoy reading, about sports, fashion, cool short stories, video games, maybe even a passage from Harry Potter. No, just kidding. You probably won't see that one. Unfortunately, on the SAT, you will also see passages about stuff that couldn't interest you less, like the biochemistry of bees or the effects of globalization on garbage disposal. You ever think, dang, it's like they're trying to bore me on purpose? Well, congratulations, you are 100% right. SAT test makers want to test to see how well you read hard, dense, and honestly, not too interesting articles. They want to see how well you do against different writing styles and different topics. Let's see what we got here on the SAT bookshelf. At least one passage of the test will be a narrative. That means a passage told from a novel, a short story, an autobiography, or a personal essay. So this will be like a passage taken away from Jane Eyre or the autobiography of Frederick Douglass. At least one will relate to science. So that means botany, zoology, chemistry, astronomy, etc. So this is maybe an article about the significance of astronomy on the development of future societies or an excerpt about the foundations of natural selection. Another will be the humanities. That's art, literature, music, philosophy. So maybe an essay about the difference in art style between Salvador Dali and Frida Kahlo, or a description on the development of classical music. A fourth will relate to social sciences. That's history, economics, sociology, government. So in this category, you might see a description of different types of religion or an account of the Civil War. Of these passages, at least one will be ethnic in nature. That means at least one will be about some kind of minority. It could be a passage about European history or a short story about a Native American girl adjusting to U.S. culture. But whatever it is, it will deal with the concerns of a particular group of people. Here's a useful tip. Remember how on most of the SATs the questions are generally organized from easiest to hardest? Well, reading passages are not organized by level of difficulty, but it is organized by something even more useful. For reading passages, questions are ordered sequentially by the order their content appears on the passage. That's right. Have you ever felt like searching for the answer to a question in a passage is kind of like searching for a pin in a haystack? It may seem that way, but hold on, because the questions are ordered sequentially. We can use that to help us locate the answer. So a question near the beginning of the set of questions, like question 10 here, probably relates to the beginning of the passage. And a question at the end of the set, like question 13 here, probably relates to near the end of the passage. The only exception are the overall passage questions, which apply to the passage in general, and are located at the very beginning or at every end of the question set. So how will you know this? And what does this mean? And how can you use this information? Well, this means that you are given clues that will help you find the location of the answer you were looking for. For example, if you know where in the passage the answer of question 10 is located, and you know where in the passage the answer 12 is located, then you can be pretty sure that the answer to question 11 is somewhere in between. That's kind of cool, huh? This should save you time searching for the answer.
Now it's time to talk about short passages. The critical reading section will have eight questions related to short passage. That may not seem like a whole lot, but short passage points are generally some of the easier points. That means you definitely don't want to skip those or fail to grab these points. I think of the points on the SAT like fruit hanging from a tree. Each piece of fruit is worth the same amount, but some are on way lower branches and much easier to grab. Why not make sure you grab those first? Now let's go over our recommended strategy for tackling the different passage types. This is the part of the lecture where we will go over how to approach reading comprehension questions. Short passages first. Since short passages are the only a couple paragraphs in length, they are super short. Thank God. That's also why they tend to be easier. So with these short passages, you should start by quickly apprehending the passage. What is apprehending? It is a type of high-speed reading where you ignore most of the details or you try to exact the main ideas only. You are going to stick your nose in the air at all those little details and facts. Your goal with apprehending is to extract the main one to two points in the article. So as you read, ask yourself, what is the main idea of this passage? Say you're a video game expert. Say you live and breathe StarCraft and you play World of Warcraft until you pass out from exhaustion at 3 a.m. every night. Well, what if you were to get a passage about the benefits of playing video games? You would go into that passage with all these personal preconceived notions, wouldn't you? It's easy to misunderstand what the author is saying when you already think you have a good idea of what the author should be saying. So you have to be careful. The more you know, the more you have to block all prior knowledge from your head. That means you will never have a question like, in which year did Abraham Lincoln become president? Because if you did, you could just look at the passage and find the answer. Instead, all the questions are going to be about what does the paragraph mean, and what did the author imply, and so forth. And that's why you wouldn't read it the way you normally read for high school exams. Instead of focusing on details like dates and facts, you ignore those completely. What you are looking for are main ideas. The kind of fast and high level reading is what we call apprehending the passage. At the end of your skim of the passage, you should be able to summarize the article in a couple sentences. Just a couple sentences. That's all the information they want you to take away. All the other stuff, the details, the adjective, the whatnots, you don't need to keep in your mind because you are only looking for the big idea here. Let's give this a go now. I'll give you two minutes to quickly read through a passage. As you read it, I want you to apprehend it. Then I want you to jot down a summary of the main idea of the passage in your notebook. Got it? You have two minutes. Good luck.
Okay, got it? I'll show you mine if you show me yours. But just kidding, I can't see yours. Passage 1. Science fiction isn't that useful except in highlights some cultural tendencies. Passage 2. Although science fiction is generally wrong, it gives kids insight to some scientific elements. Does that look a lot like yours? This exercise of jotting down a summary is a great way for me to make sure that I understand the passage. Of course, on the real SAT, you're not going to be able to jot down summaries, but instead you should just get used to thinking of them in your head as you read. This process of apprehending is super important to the SATs. But hey, it's also pretty important in real life too. Many times in college or at your job someday, you will need to be able to read and understand the main ideas really quickly, and that's when this skill will come in handy again. Once you've apprehended this passage, then you want to tackle the question. But remember, you must be able to point your finger at the answer in the passage before you circle the answer. For example, let's take a look at this question. The question reads, The author of passage 1 would agree with the author of passage 2 that what? A. Science fiction can inspire young people to become scientists. B. Science fiction is more absurd than westerns. C. Science fiction is not an accurate description of scientific fact. D. Young people should read science fiction to expand their knowledge of culture. Or E. Science fiction can teach scientific methodology. Just looking at the question, I can already tell how it could be very easy to mess up and forget which passage said what and meant what. For example, did passage 1 say science fiction inspired young people? Maybe. Or was that passage 2? Or neither? It's hard to remember. Don't rely on your memory. Why would you? You are given the power of having the passage with all the answers right there in front of you. The answer is right there, staring at you. Let's take a good look back at it. I'm going to walk you through my thought process as I solve one of these questions so you can get a feel for this. It may seem like a long process to you, but you really do have to go through every answer choice. As you practice, you gradually achieve extraterrestrial-like speeds, just like me. Let's look at A. Science fiction can inspire young people to become scientists. Glancing over passage 1, I see that the author kind of hates on science fiction. He definitely didn't think science fiction inspired young people. So let's cross off A right away, because now we know that can't be correct. Let's look at B. Science fiction is more absurd than westerns. Let's check out passage 1. In lines 3 through 5 it says, Most of the science is wrong anyway, and it amounts as such that one might as well be reading westerns in the hopes of finding out about ranching methods. Okay, so the author isn't really saying science fiction is more absurd than westerns, he's just comparing the two. Let's cross off B, too. What about C? Science fiction is not an accurate description of scientific fact. Let's check out passage 1. In lines 3 through 5 that we just checked, it says, most of the science is wrong anyway. Great, so the author definitely thinks science fiction isn't accurate. And we know this for sure because we are able to put our fingers on the exact line of the passage that told us the answer. Now let's look at passage 2. In the first line, line 12, the passage reads, Much of the science in science fiction is hokum. Some of it is totally wrong. Dang, this author guy definitely doesn't think science fiction is right either.
Fantastic. So it looks like we have a winner right here, and it's called answer choice C. However, before we can circle anything as the correct answer, we should look at all the answer choices. Let's take a peek at D. Young people should read science fiction to expand their knowledge of culture. Ah, passage 1 does say in lines 8 through 9 that science fiction provides a fictional mode in which cultural tendencies can be isolated and judged. But be careful. The author doesn't say anything to suggest young people should read science fiction. So no, D is not a good answer. So let's cross it out. Lastly, let's look at E. Science fiction can teach scientific methodology. Going back to passage 1, I see again lines 3 through 5 are basically saying that science fiction is completely whack and totally wrong. So no, the dude who wrote passage 1 would not think that science fiction teaches scientific methodology. Bravo! And we are done! Let's cross off E and circle C, the correct answer. Practice, practice, practice. I wish I could let you off the hook, but I can't. Practice is a critical thing for a test like the SATs, so we have to do it. Let's try a short passage together now. This is an example of a humanities passage. I'll give you five minutes to work on these, and then we'll go over the answers. Got it? Good luck, guys.
Okay, time is up. If you're not done yet, hit the pause button real fast and rejoin us when you're ready. But for the rest of you, right now, we are going to go over the lovely correct answers. Answers 1, C, 2, A, 3, D, and 4, D. I'll give you a minute to grade yourself. Now it's time to talk about short passages. The critical reading section will have eight questions related to short passage. That may not seem like a whole lot, but short passage points are generally some of the easier points. That means you definitely don't want to skip those or fail to grab these points. I think of the points on the SAT like fruit hanging from a tree. Each piece of fruit is worth the same amount, but some are on way lower branches and much easier to grab. Why not make sure you grab those first? It definitely makes sense to. Question 1 reads, in line 4, ironically, refers to the fact of what? Let's head to line 4, which reads, Yet ironically, the most important poems of her maturity were political and feminist. She was preoccupied with the liberation of Italy, anti-slavery, and the role of women. Did you get that? The author is saying, dang, even though the most important poems were the political ones, she wasn't even well known for those. Therefore, answer C is correct. The most important work of a great poet are not the most popular. Make sense? Now let's move on to question two. It reads, which statement about the poem Aurora Lee can be inferred from the passage? Here we have a set of three statements and it's our job to see which ones are implied from the passage. These questions that have sets are time consuming because they are really more like three in one questions. But don't worry, they are also the most straightforward since they are usually asking about straightforward facts. Let's take a look at each statement at a time. One, it is as romantically compelling as the work of Charlotte Bronte. Before we can answer this, let's go back to the passage and read up on the poem Aurora Lee. The passage says in lines six through 10, it is in the context of those concerns as reflected in Casa Fuidi windows, Aurora Lee, poems before Congress, and last poems that her justly famous love poems to Robert Browning ought to be read. Unfortunately, those poems relating her ideology are rarely read today. We can see that Aurora Lee must be a political poem that is not well read. Let's go back to the question. Statement one is not correct. Aurora Lee is a political poem. It is not one of Browning's romantically compelling poems. Let's cross that one off. Statement two, it contains socio-political themes. Let's head back to the passage. The passage says in lines four through nine, yet ironically, the most important poems of her maturity were political and feminist. She was preoccupied with the liberation of Italy, anti-slavery, and the role of women. It is in the context of these concerns, as reflected in Casa Fuidi windows, Aurora Lee, poems before Congress, and last poems that her justly famous love poems to Robert Browning ought to be read. Okay, so Aurora Lee contained political and feminist themes. Then yes, those are sociopolitical themes. Sociopolitical is just a fancy way of saying relating to both social and political concerns. Going back to statement two, 
Let's circle that because that is correct. Let's take a look at statement three. It is one of the most popular of Browning's poems. Ah, but we already know from what we just read that Aurora Lee was not well read. Therefore, let's cross off three. Only statement two is correct. Therefore, the correct answer choice is A. Moving on, let's go over question three. The author most likely would encourage the reader of Browning's love poems to do what? Well, we know that the author believes that Browning's most important poems are her political ones. Therefore, D is the correct answer. The author would ask readers to also appreciate the importance of the poet's other works. Question four reads, which statement best summarized the contents of the passage? Let's head back to the passage. Lines nine through 12 read, unfortunately, those poems relating to her ideology are rarely read today. Perhaps this is because Browning's personal history provided the public with a story as compelling as the plot of Charlotte Bronte's novel, Jane Eyre. Wow, so sounds like Browning had a really dramatic personal life that kind of took the spotlight away from her serious work. Sounds a lot like she has something in common with Tiger Woods and President Clinton. The correct answer is D. Stories of Browning's life have overshadowed the other aspects of her work. So how are you doing with these passages? Are you way ahead of me, or are you still struggling a bit? Remember, we are going over medium level questions in this video series, so don't stress out too much if you're still struggling a bit or if they're way easy. We'll cover reading passage questions that are exactly your level in our live workshops titled Reading Passage Keys. And that's because we'll sort you into a small class of students that are all your level. You might be wondering, well, what if the questions are about the little details that I didn't bother to memorize? Are you sure it's okay to overlook those details? The answer is yes, because the SAT is an open book test. So, duh, the answers are right in front of you, basically just staring at you. The real test isn't to memorize the article, it's to understand it. The SAT is never going to test you on facts, and that is what makes the SAT so very different from your normal high school exam.